Okay, that's long enough. So, um, I'm Brian Chapados. Uh, you are also my blog. I'm actually a scientist at Strips. And I think it was maybe a month ago or so, Matt Caminetti emailed me and wanted to know how non-developers were using Ruby. So I tend to work with a lot of different kinds of data. And I mean, my title, Data Processing with Ruby, is sort of intentionally vague. But I kind of want to give you an idea of the type of things that you can use Ruby for in a scientific environment. It can be quick and dirty, but still get the job done. And it's actually a lot more useful than writing shell scripts and things. So, I'll get started. So what I work on is X-ray crystallography, and I'm a structural biologist, so I'm interested in three-dimensional structures of proteins. And so, the protein is, the, is represented in two forms here. At the top, you have a the sequence of what looks like uh, random nonsense. That's actually a sequence of amino acids that are sort of like little little chains that are, are little units that get linked together by a linear chain. So all these things are, are linked together by bond, and each symbol represents a different type of amino acid. So if you've heard of amino acids, that's what those are, linked together to make one protein. And so what happens is that inside your cells, these things fold up, in three-dimensional space. And they can even come together, so you can have multiple proteins come together. And what you end up with is a structure down, like I'm showing on the bottom, that was determined by looking at it with X-ray diffraction. And so we, we, know, we can see the atomic details of this thing. And so that's, that's the type of information that I'm typically dealing with. So you need a way to go from some kind of sample in a tube represented by this linear thing to this three-dimensional structure. Um, usually involves a lot of work. And the typical things that we use, uh, they work well for maybe one protein. But if you have multiple proteins, and this is just a model slide illustrating what one, of the, one like simple process, actually, that we think might be going on, where you have things moving around and things binding to each other, it's really hard to actually experimentally address these things using the typical methods. So one of the things we can do is if we just have a solution, things are uh, existed water, no problem, you can dissolve them up. Uh, we can take an x-ray beam at a high energy synchrotron source and just blast it at the sample. And most of the energy goes directly through, but some of it's absorbed and it makes these rings. So this is actually the data. That thing on the left, that's actually uh, the result of x-ray scattering on a sample of protein. And what we get back is the thing on the right, which is essentially a graph, a 1D graph. And from that, what we really would like to do is get some idea of what the shape looks like. So even if we don't have all the details, we just could know, oh, it looks like a circle. That's actually knowing a lot more than it's just a, I mean, we basically have no idea what it looks like, right? And you can try and predict based on what the linear sequence is, what it might look like, but if you can actually make the stuff, then this is a really simple technique that you can use. The problem is getting from this image on the left, I guess, to back to some, oops, back to some kind of, uh, back to some type of model that you can actually use is kind of intensive, and it requires lots of different steps. So, for example, here's uh, just raw data. I mean, everything is numbers, right? We just you get this thing, the detector measures it, and it spits out numbers, zero or whatever, some kind of x, y. In this case, um, this is actually past one step of processing, and what we're looking at is um, a function that relates the pairwise distance between what between every pair of electrons it thinks is in there. So um, there's software that will take this information and try and build a, a three-dimensional model from it. And this has mostly been developed over at the EMBL because they've been doing this for years, since the early 90s. And they have a website. You can download it. It's free. Unfortunately, it's not open source. Okay, It works well, but... Frequently, we want to run these things multiple times. Um, the interfaces are sort of built to be interactive. They're not easily scriptable. And um, just to give you an example, because you really do have to see what I'm talking
That concludes this episode of the SD.RB podcast. See you next time.